Hey guys, welcome to the Quick Talk Podcast, the only show handcrafted for small business entrepreneurs looking to explode their business. It's time to get your mind right so you can get your grind right. Are you ready? Yeah, well, Google invested in Nest because they want to basically control basically everything that happens in your house. So the future of where this is going is you're going to search Google, select a cleaning service on Google. Google is then going to dispatch to somebody like my company who's going to show up with an Android Google-owned smartphone. That smartphone is going to know that I'm the cleaning company that was hired at this date and time at your house. It's going to unlock the lock, which is owned by Google, to let me in your house going to log how long I'm in your house, probably watch me on the cameras, which are owned by Google in your house, log the time I leave your house, charge you exactly to the second for the amount of time I'm in your house. And it knows that because it's able to track that off the locks and the mobile phones, which are used for access. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining me here on the Quick Talk podcast. As you know, my name is Josh, and my job is to bring you no fluff, straight to the point, small business insight from some of the success stories from all over the world. And today I'm joined by Derek Christian. He's the owner of My Maid Service in Cincinnati, Ohio, the absolute largest business of its kind in the region. They currently have over 70 employees and they do over two and a half million in revenue. Uh, And you heard me right. So he's also the co-author of the Professional House Cleaning Technician's Manual. He's a past board member of ARCSI, the Association of Cleaning Services International. He's been featured on CNN Money, CBS News, and even Better Homes and Gardens. I'm I'm excited to dive into this conversation because we're going to take a fresh look at some, some SEO, search engine optimization, but really a lot more stuff as well. Derek, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day and joining me here on the Quick Talk Podcast. Oh, no problem. I'm looking forward to it. Well, Derek, before we get into some of the specifics, could you give me a little bit of your backstory? I mean, you have this large company in Ohio. You guys have a large team. You're doing all this stuff. You're a busy guy. How did you get to this point? Uh, Well, before I actually got into the cleaning business, I worked at Procter & Gamble for 13 years. And more specifically, I was on the team called P&G Professional that sold cleaning products to cleaning companies through uh, distributors, uh, janitorial distributors. And through that, got some exposure to my customers and I was always very intrigued by the service industry and uh, really enjoyed serving the customers. And sort of like the story, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Roy Kroc with McDonald's. He actually didn't start McDonald's. He was selling milkshakes and uh, bought them out. And I was selling cleaning products to a cleaning company here in Cincinnati She had burned out a little bit and decided she wanted to move on to something new. So I actually started by buying the company. Um, I actually didn't start it. It had about $200,000 worth of revenue when I acquired it. And that was eight years ago now. And then just kind of took everything I'd learned at P&G and applied it. And then everything I kind of learned through the school of hard knocks of doing it on the street and uh, tried to make it the best I could. Well, wow, that's really interesting. And I bet, you know, some of the corporate knowledge that you brought to the small business must have really helped you because the scale, you know, from a couple hundred thousand in revenue and to sky past the two million mark uh, in just a few short years, that's not something that's very easy to do for most people. What do you think was a contributing to that success? Yeah, there were a couple of things. One of which was at P&G, we used to always do after action reports. A lot of ex-military guys running around P&G. So whenever anything happened, it major, whether it was good or bad, we would always dissect it, figure out, all right, what happened? Why did it happen? How can we make sure it either happens again if it was a good outcome or doesn't happen again if it was a bad outcome? And just kind of took that discipline uh, to this business. And like I said, we've messed up plenty of things, but each time we sat down and dissected it and talked about it to figure out how we can make sure we don't do that again and that we don't repeat the same mistakes over and over again. Uh, the other thing, which was a big benefit, which I didn't even realize at the time was abnormal, was how we manage the employees. And pretty quickly, I decided I need to do some performance reviews. And coming from Procter & Gamble, I'm, I just swept off my old uh, P&G, uh, what, what we used to call it there was a work and development plan, and use that with my employees. And it kind of revolutionized things with a lot of them because the very first question on that work and development plan was, so what's your career aspirations? What are your goals? Where do you want to be? Because that document has two parts to it. One part is about here is what your job was and how you did on it. That's the work part. But the second part was the development part. 
which was where are you trying to get in your career? What experiences do we as a company need to give you? What training do you need? And for most of my employees, that was really revolutionary. No one had ever sat down with them and asked them, what's your long-term career goal? And uh, sort of the breakthrough moment was I, one of the most senior employees, I had just bought the company. I was about three months in. She'd been here about eight years before I bought it. You know, I sat down and asked, so what do you want to do, you know, five years from now? And she said, well, to be honest, I don't want to be working for you. And I, you know, said, okay, great. So what do you want to do? And she explained she really wanted to be working in a doctor's office as a receptionist or something. And I didn't flip out or get mad or try to talk her out of it. I talked to her, okay, well, if you want that, here's the various trainings you're going to need. Here's the skills you're going to need. Maybe we can have you come into the office and do these type of things so that you can get those types of experiences. And she kind of went out and told all the other employees about it. And that was a really big turning point for us where uh, the employees realized that they could have a career here, not just a job, and that we actually kind of cared about where they were going. Wow. That is a lot to unpack. There's a lot of gold nuggets in there. I hope everybody's listening because for small local service businesses, I don't think we focus enough on the employee experience. And some of the things that I talk about, uh, Derek, I call it what you just described, giving the employees a seat at the table, you know, letting them participate in the vision for your company and really just connecting with them in an authentic way because people will go to the ends of the earth and back if they know that you genuinely care about them. And for a small business, your team is everything. I mean, the wheels will fall off really quickly if you don't have a solid team in place. Obviously, I'm sure you agree with that, correct? Oh, definitely. Especially if you don't want to be in constant fire mode and putting out issues all over the place. No, absolutely not. And employee culture, I mean, I knew that you must have had something going on because it, you, it's almost impossible to scale a home service business unless you have a strong underlying culture because you can't retain top talent and you can't motivate people enough to really keep everything organized in a business like that unless you have that in place. So it's super awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I know when we talked last week preparing for this call, uh, one of the things that you touched on was search engine optimization. And I knew within a minute that you really had a lot of expertise in this area. Um, can you break down some of the things that you're doing and some of the things that are coming down the pipe that could really help our listeners prepare and, and maybe better themselves in that area for their business? Well, like you said, that's a big topic. So breaking it down into a lot of different pieces. Um, our business is almost completely driven off of internet referrals at this point. Um, and almost all of our business comes from search engine optimization. Um, and that, when you think about it, when you Google a term, three things normally pop up. You've got the paid advertisements at the top of the page. You've got the local returns, which most people refer to the six pack, which is where you get the map of the A, B, C, D. And then you've got the Google natural results under that. Here in Cincinnati, if you Google made service Cincinnati, we pop up number one in the six pack and we pop up number one most of the time in local or in the natural search. Now, that varies. It's a constant battle, but we're always one to three. And that's where the vast majority of our business comes from. So there's three parts there. I don't get too much into AdWords because in my experience, uh, that cost per click game has really gone up. There's a lot of robots and things like that, and that's not search engine optimization. Local, which is that six-pack on a map, is really Google's gift to small businesses. And I find most businesses don't do this very well. Uh, it highly favors, first of all, it's free, by the way. So if you don't have your Google local or Google My Business profile, they change the name about every three months. So some people call it Google local, my business. Uh, some people call it Google Plus for business. It's all the same thing. But if you haven't gone out and claimed your Google Plus profile where they send you that little postcard in the mail where you type the code in, you really need to do that because the first thing that that Google local search highly favors is geographic search. So if you are near to your customer base, and you are physically close to them, it's always going to favor just based off of you're three miles away and the other guy's 10 miles away. The next thing that it goes off of is number of reviews. And a lot of people don't do a nearly good enough job of getting reviews from their clients. And we don't pay for reviews. We don't do any of that gimmicky stuff. We have found the single most effective way to get a review is to have one human ask another human for a review. So everyone wants to know on this part how to automate it, what leave behinds you can leave, how much you can pay a client. We found none of that works. The one thing that works is when you're on the phone with them, you're doing the follow-up call, and they say they're really happy with the service, and you say, hey, great, I really appreciate it. Would you be willing to write a Google review, and you send them a link? The other time that's been great for us to get reviews is we're a residential cleaning service, so we have reoccurring customers. 
But when a long-time customer cancels service for nothing, it has nothing to do with uh, poor service, they're moving out of the area, their kids are graduating, gone to college, and they're calling and basically saying, hey, you need to terminate service. We're moving to California, and I don't have an office in California yet. Um, we'll say, great, well, we really appreciate all these years. Hey, would you be willing to write us a review? Um, you know, they feel really bad that they're canceling service. Um, you didn't do anything wrong, and a lot of times we can get a great review from them there. So just claiming that profile, putting pictures in there, interacting with it, et cetera, as good as we are with search engine optimization. Like I said, if you type in my main service Cincinnati, we pop up number one under uh, the natural search. We get three times as much traffic to our Google profile than we do our actual website. Um, and this is hard to explain sort of on a podcast, but if you look it up right now on your cell phone and you Google a clean, Google any cleaning service in your area, whether it's window cleaning, pressure washing, maid service, that little six pack that pops up. If you click on the company name on your mobile phone, it does not take you to the company website. It takes you to the Google business profile site. So if you haven't claimed that and set it up and really thought about that just as much as you have your own website, you're making a big mistake because we get two to three times more traffic on our Google page than we do on our own web page because Google is sent directing more and more of that traffic to that page, which they own, instead of your web page. Wow, wow. Okay, I'm taking notes <laughs> as you're talking because there's so much here and it's all just valuable, valuable, valuable information. The first note that I wrote down was your comment. You said it was a gift to small businesses. So Google Local or Google Plus for Business or whatever you said, you know, that little... Did you call it the six pack with a map? Is that what you called it? Yeah, they, a lot of people refer to it as the six pack because when you when you Google a phrase, normally six companies pop up. Not always because there's not always six, but if there are more than six, six will show up. Okay, got it. So when you Google something, a local business, you get that little six pack, you get the little map with the pins in it saying, okay, you got company A, company B, company C. A ton of guys aren't even using that, which is pure madness. It's just crazy because it's totally free. And it's at the very top of the search results. And it's just like low-hanging fruit, right? I mean, these are f free leads that you're just, why are you even in business if you're not doing that? Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's the quickest and easiest way that I know to get in business. When we open a new office, um, getting our website to rank takes a while, but we can get our Google local listing to rank almost immediately just by claiming it. Now, we're not going to rank everywhere, but once again, at least where you're physically located it should be very easy to get into that six pack because uh, you can get a couple reviews, claim it, and you should pop up in there right away. Now, unfortunately, where Google Plus is a little bit of a negative is bigger companies like mine because when you cover a massive geography, Google heavily favors nearby locations. It, the way I explain it is it, it treats everything like a hair salon so that when you Google a cleaning service, it assumes you want a cleaning service within driving distance of your house. So when you get larger businesses like mine, which cover large service areas, it's a little bit trickier for us. So for the smaller companies, it's a huge gift because it highly favors you being closer to your customers. Also something to think about maybe when you're locating your office, while a cheap rent district in an industrial area may make sense in some regards, if it's far away from where your customers are, it can actually hurt you on that Google search. Wow, that's a good point because a lot of the guys, one of the biggest first uh, success steps that they take when they begin to build a small company is they get, you know, an office or a shop, right? They, they get excited. They want to move into a warehouse. They get their own space. Maybe they got five or seven employees now. Um, and you really maybe want to think about that uh, when you're going to lease commercial space, uh, make sure that it's maybe centrally located. I mean, you're in a huge metropolitan area, so you must be getting just huge amounts of traffic and deal flow from this stuff. Uh, do you think that this is just as important for a company that's maybe in a more rural area? Uh, definitely. I mean, in, in the more rural areas, you typically have less competition, so it's easier to pop up on that six-pack. You know, while it, in a more dense area like mine, you can compete a little bit better. There's also a lot more companies. Um, but even in smaller cities, we're finding people get most of their business off of the search engine. Um, I work with some other cleaning companies through my role with the uh, international, the RC Trade Association you talked about earlier. And I found, you know, one and two million dollar companies that operate in towns of 30,000, 40,000 people. And it's all because they dominate the search engine optimization. Um, one of my offices is in Lebanon, Ohio, which is the northernmost suburb of Cincinnati. And we've done so good out here in Lebanon that if you Google made service Lebanon, 
we're number one. Our Facebook page is number three. Our Yelp profile is number five. And some download we have available is number nine. So when you're in a smaller city, you can actually make it to not only are you on the front page, you dominate the front page. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you'll be the only logical choice to call. <laughs> so, and, and that's, it's almost like social proof to a customer who's searching, right? So when they get inundated with just reviews and links to all these different, um, God, what do they call the reputation management sites like the Yelps and the, what? If, if the whole page is your company, you, you have instant credibility with the customer as well. Is that correct? Oh, definitely. And that's one of the things you really want to try to do is build credibility. Now, that's all about the local side. You kind of mentioned credibility, so I'm going to kind of transition to search engine optimization, which is for the natural search. So that's the bottom third of the page. And one of the things that's really important that is underrated by most cleaning services is the user experience on your website. And this gets a little technical, but I think it'll make sense to most people. Um, Google has caught on that people have figured out how to gain things. Um, as you know, a lot of people can get fake backlinks. Um, there's things where people are famous for putting a bunch of keywords on their phrase, on their pages and cramming keywords in the pages. So one thing that Google started to use in the past, and it, they're giving more and more priority to is what a consumer does when they get to your page. So if you go to Google and you type in clean service your city and 10 results pop up and you click on the first one and you go to the first page and you look around and you press the back button, you go back to the list. Google actually basically counts that as a down vote because in Google's view, what just happened is you asked for something. I gave you 10 results. You went to the web page, didn't do anything and came back to the list, meaning you weren't happy with the result you found. So one of the worst things that can happen in Google world is somebody to come to your website, look around and go back to the Google main list without doing something. And this is really important because a lot of old school marketers like me, I come out of Procter & Gamble, we always made our phone number really key and prominent on the page. The problem with that is if a consumer is calling, comes to your website, calls your phone number, and then maybe leaves a message, press, presses back, and then goes to the next page, next page down, unless they're using a mobile device where they actually do that little quick-to-call feature, Google actually sees that as a bad thing. They see that as a bounce. Um, those of you may be familiar with your um, Google Analytics reports, you have one of the things that tells you is your bounce rate which is how many people come to your website, look at one page, and then leave. And if you've got a high bounce rate, Google actually will penalize your search engine optimization over time. It'll notice that I'm sending people to your site, they're doing nothing as far as I can tell, and then they're coming back to my list and going to another site. Well, it just makes so much sense. I mean, to Google, Google's function and in, in purpose of life is to deliver relevant results to the person doing the search. And if you're... Uh, bouncing as far as Google's concerned, obviously they're going to bury you down the list because that's going to enhance the search results. Google thinks at least it's algorithm thinks uh, for the searcher because it wants to deliver links where people hang out for a while and they, they click through to several pages and they read content. I mean, that's essentially what you're saying, correct? Right. The more they interact with your website, the better Google's going to rank you. So if they go and click on a couple pages, that's good. If they fill out a form, that's better. Google's saying, ah, you're now passing information. That means you're interested. But the gold standard is if they, if they go to a secure area and do some type of credit card transaction. And Google can tell that. They can tell that I sent someone to your website, they went to a secure area and did some type of credit card transaction. Because in our world, that is basically the ultimate upvote. I gave you money. And that's one of the reasons why you're seeing a lot of upstarts that are using either, you know, the Handy model or the HomeJoy model or even local small guys. There's some software that let small independents do this. They're popping to the top of search engine pretty quick is because they're allowing consumers to actually complete transactions on their website, actually book and, uh, book and pay for a service. Because Google sees that as the ultimate upload, which is I sent you somewhere and not only did you actually go there and click and fill out a form, you gave them a credit card. Right. That's unbelievable. And, and gosh, it's, it changes so fast, Derek. I mean, I did, um, I am no expert in this particular space. Okay. But I had a cleaning business in Michigan and we dominated all of our organic and natural and local results. I had local locations at all the different cities that we serviced because originally you could kind of get away with that back in the day. And, and it just gave us humongous amounts of business and deal flow and leads. And, uh, we really killed it. And I was kind of on top of that back then, but you know, as my business scaled, it never was a major focus for me. 
But the thing that's interesting most as I listen to you talk is how how much changes so quickly in technology, especially with Google and the algorithm, the way that they're ranking stuff, the way that they're evolving and learning. And for a little owner operator, Derek, it's not an easy thing for them to you know stay on top of all this stuff all the time. Uh, do you have any recommendations for you know how they just keep their head on straight as they as they try to go down this road? Should they hire a professional? Is there a certain you know, resource or something for them. What do you have to say, you know, to that? Unfortunately, hiring professionals is really tricky. There's a lot of people in this industry that, in that industry that don't do a great job and a good one is not going to be cheap. So unfortunately, I can't give much recommendation on hiring a professional except to tell you that if you're not paying much, you're probably not going to get a lot out of it. I find normally it works best when the owner's doing it because your or owner or someone in your company. Uh, because they're closer to understanding the business. There, it, I know it all sounds very confusing, but there's some relatively easy things you can do. Um, the first one is I subscribe to a newsletter from an organization called Search Engine Watch, and they literally just issue a weekly newsletter that says, here's what's changing with search engines. And you don't need to follow every single little detail. The great thing about the home services space is, for the most part, our competition isn't that sophisticated. Um, if you were to have a real search engine optimization guy, and there might be a couple of them on this call right now who are, you know, really experts and they're out there looking at my website, they could probably write you a list of 60 things that I do wrong. My website is not the be-all, end-all of everything. But what I've kind of figured out is some things that do matter. You can complete transactions on my website. I've got the right keywords in. You know, there's certain things that I do really, really well that others don't. I've got the reviews. So you don't want to necessarily chase every single thing, but just kind of watch the trends and see what's coming. The other thing is you want to stay on top of what's changing because a lot of times the early mover takes an advantage. And for example, I was one of the first people in my area to use Angie's List when it came out because uh, I just tend to jump on that stuff. So I got a bunch of reviews early. So now whenever anyone goes to Angie's List, I've got 200 and something reviews. So they go to me first. And I get the first shot at them. So once I got that lead, I get more calls, which means I now get even more reviews. So my lead gets even bigger. The good news about this space constantly changing, while it can also drive you nuts, it also opens up a lot of opportunity. Like Facebook just announced that they're going to be introducing Facebook services, where you can go onto Facebook and look for a cleaning service using the Facebook search engine. And what's going to be really interesting about that search engine is Facebook isn't going to give you um, recommendations based on every reviewer in the world. They're going to give you recommendations based on what your friends like and don't like under the assumption that if you're a foodie like me, you're probably going to want to eat the type of places your friends do. We don't care about the people that maybe would prefer a burger. So what, what that is, is it's a really unique opportunity, though, because it's brand new. They just introduced it. Nobody ranks. So if you can figure out that one thing, that one area, and become the number one there, you're going to get more reviews than anyone else. You're going to get more calls than anyone else. And then it becomes self-perpetuating. So I'm always kind of trying to watch out what, what's new, whether it's Amazon services, because Amazon's now reselling services, and you can work through them, whether it's Facebook services, or whatever the new thing is. I always try to be the first one in there. Um, so it is infuriating in some ways because it's constantly changing. But if you feel like, you know, you've always been behind in the past, it's almost like there's a reset. And you can say, all right, you know, I'm so far behind on Google, I'm never going to be number one. But gosh, the Facebook thing, that's brand new. I could take the lead on that before anyone else is even using it. Well, <laughs> I think the underlying point that I'm getting out of this, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but people need to be working on their business rather than in their business. And this is a reoccurring theme on this show and many shows and it's some of the best business books in the world really t speak to this. But, you know, Derek, because you had that corporate experience, you came into your company with the correct mentality from the beginning that you had bought an asset and your job was to enhance, grow and optimize the asset and to, in all areas, the employees, the way that you handled your company culture to the way that you were driving lead traffic and, you know, the importance of systems and automation, but really having time and freeing yourself up to even be able to work on this stuff is one of the biggest challenges for the little guys, the artisans, the one man truck guys, the, the small three, five employee people. Uh, they got to carve out time to make this stuff a priority or you're just, you're never going to get there. 
Listen up. Now remember, being self-employed is not the same as being a business owner. And if you are looking for a way to automate your business and build yourself a clear path to the dream that keeps eluding you, then check out my online small business bootcamp. It's a go at your own pace. It's power packed. It's a mind bomb. It will help you understand exactly how to architecture out and systematize your small business right now so you can finally be back in control. Go to windowwealth.com right now and check it out. Use the code MINDBOMB to save 30%. It's time to invest in yourself. I know that your business must utilize a lot of systemization. You mentioned earlier uh, the follow-up call. So I know you're doing follow-ups with your customers. Obviously, that's yep. huge for anybody that's got a serious business. And you said that the best way to get a review was one human asking another human, <laughs> which I love the way that you worded that. Could you maybe give us an insight in some of the other things you're doing systematically with your customer experience? Like, you know, you get all these leads in, you have to sell them. How do you handle that process? And then after they do the job itself, is there anything, you know, systemized there? And then after with the follow-up, can you give me an overview of what that looks like for you? Well, there's a couple things. One of which is one of the phrases we used to use at P&G, which sticks with me to this day, is if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. So I've got some key performance indexes that I always keep an eye on. Um, for example, how long does it take us to return a call to a, a lead? It's one of the most important things to me, as I've discovered, is it's often a race. The first one to get back in touch with them normally wins the business. Um, we track quality scores. We do follow up after every single cleaning um, and ask the customers to rank us on a scale of one to five. And then that score creates a company quality score. And I can also then break that down by cleaner. So I can not only track my overall company trends, but I can know who my rock stars are and who the people are that may need some intervention of some type or not. Uh, so it all comes down to being able to measure it because when you measure it, then you can take action on it. If you're not measuring it, it's all gut reaction. And it also really helps with the mood swings of business. And what I mean by that is even a highly successful business is going to get the occasional really bad day where the wheels fall off and everything that goes wrong can go wrong. And, and I can tell you some horror stories. But when you've got that data to go, you know what, we're a really good company. And this was a really weird day. And I need to make sure this doesn't happen again. But the data says we're heading in the right direction. This is not earth shattering. On the flip side, I've seen people who can be self-delusional and because they have one or two happy customers, oh, I've got a lot of customers who love me. Mrs. Smith yesterday just called and said what a great job they did, but they, they aren't seeing the overall trend. So having that real data lets you be able to kind of get away from the day-to-day, -day, you know, buffeting of the chaos that's coming and look at the bigger trends. Yeah. I mean, numbers and data don't lie, right? They don't have an ulterior motive. They just, they're just raw truth. <laughs> so, you know, living in that world of KPIs and, you know, having, you know, all of your metrics laid out in some sort of a dashboard or a leaderboard somewhere, it's, it's not that hard to set that stuff up. It's not that hard to implement simple ways to track that. Even if you're a tiny company, guys, you got to do this stuff. Be an executive, not just a cleaner or a technician. That's how you're going to grow a business. I think that's incredible insight, Derek. Thank you so much. If you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. That is, I wrote that down because that's, that's a really, really good quote there. Uh, are you a reader by chance? Is that, is that something that's important to you uh, just to continue your education? Um, is there a good book you've read in the last year maybe you could share with us? Yeah, I've switched largely to audiobooks at this point because I can download them free from my local library and listen to them as I run or uh, in the car ride. But yes, I typically rotate between a business book and a fun book. So I rotate between the two. Right. I mean, personal development is important. Do you have, you know, mentors or friends or a mastermind or any kind of people? How do you stay sharp? How do you stay focused? Are you just, you know, one of those freaks that's self-motivated and you're just a maniac building this empire down in Ohio? Or, or is there a little more to it than that? Is that important? You know, the value of relationships and being around similarly like-minded people? No, I definitely have sort of a mastermind group of three cleaning business owners that I work with on a regular basis. Um, my real core strength is sales and marketing, uh, but there's another guy in our group who is a systems and process guy. While I, I seem to be good, he puts me to shame. And another woman who um, I've learned so much from when it comes to cleaners. So I definitely have a group that I work with that complement my skills and I complement theirs very well. We've actually helped each other in our businesses, sometimes served as consultants to each other. 
I'm always looking for new ideas. Um, you know, you mentioned books, and one of the ones that I've liked recently is Zingerman's On Service. And not because the book itself was so unique. Um, a lot of times I'm just looking for one thing I can use. And in that book, there was a phrase that I love, and I've been using it with my uh, my uh, office staff recently, and that is great customer service and it is innately unfair. Um, and I love that phrase because I've always had a really hard time sometimes explaining to my staff, you know, that to make the customer happy, you need to get over this idea of it's fair or it's not fair. It doesn't matter. Great customer service is innately unfair. It means sometimes you're going to be cheated. It means sometimes you're going to be doing something that, you know, maybe you shouldn't have to do, but it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, if you want to have great customer service, you've got to get over this idea of fairness, which is beat into us from when we're little kids. And that book did such a great job explaining that. So I've copied those like three or four pages out of that book and use it with employees and kind of explain. So that's what I'm looking for a lot of times. I'll read a 200-page book and take three pages out. Uh, But that was a really good one for me recently. Yeah, and those nuggets are worth everything if you actually implement them in your business. Where I think people miss it the most, Derek, is they don't execute. They they're perpetual learners. They're perpetual consumers of content, information. People listen to this podcast, probably listen to three other, you know, podcasts, but the real question is are you going in on Monday and making this stuff happen in your business? I mean, have you ever struggled with execution? I mean, you're more of a corporate, you know, pound it, measure it, get it done, lay it out there, but a lot of people struggle with that. Now, execution is always a big deal. Even now, it's a big deal. It's so easy to get sucked into the day-to-day. Um, it's so easy to want to get pulled into things. Um, so what I do is I try to always have an action plan for the week, and I, I kind of break it up by a week. Every week, I want to do something to make the phones ring. I want to do something that retains my employees, and I want to do something that makes a system run better. And sometimes, and those are my three goals. Every week, I got to move. I got to do something in those three areas. And if I haven't done something in those three areas, I, I fail for the week. And it's not always massive. You know, doing something for the employees could be as simple as sitting down with my office staff and asking for three recommendations of cleaners that went above and beyond for the week and writing them a thank you note. Um, the system could be as small as fixing a form that's been driving me crazy because it's got a misspelling on it. But the point is, every single week, we got to get a little bit better in those three areas. And if we get a little bit better every single week, um, it makes a huge difference. And I can't remember the name of the book right now, but Darren Hardy um, from Success Magazine has a whole book that's basically that principle, which is you just constantly got to be making little improvements. And if you keep doing that, you know, 50 weeks, 52 weeks later, I've made 52 small improvements in those three areas. It's like a completely different company. Oh, man, that's gold. One of my favorite quotes is progress, not perfection. And I personally struggle in this area big time. I, I I tend to have an all or nothing personality. So I like to be, you know, all in, hardcore, big visions, big goals, huge execution, or just kind of nothing at all. And really, you can't be that way. You have to have maturity and discipline to, to focus on small incremental changes that will lead to that more polished system and company in the future. Yeah, and uh, we have a similar phrase. We say perfection is the enemy of progress. Yeah. And that's great too. It's just a different way to word it. It, It's just a fundamental truth of life. You know, like ants, you know, you just have to chip away at it. You can't eat the elephant in one bite. You're not going to build a two, three, five million dollar business, you know, instantly. It's a progression and we need to enjoy the journey as well. So these are just amazing insights. Before I let you go though, I wanted to circle back to one more topic. Uh, You mentioned, you know, Amazon, Facebook, Google, all these guys are starting to crowd into this space. I don't know what to call this space. I don't know if there's a label for it, but this whole idea of connecting contractors with customers, right? Like Home Advisor, Angie's List, those are just kind of the beginning. But some of these big behemoths are starting to get ready and gear up for these these services. Can you explain kind of what you've found to be coming soon with that and how that's going to affect all of us out here? Yeah, unfortunately, you're going to see more and more of it. Basically, Silicon Valley and the venture capital firms have decided that owning a marketplace is a great place to be. Um, when you think about it, Apple and Google, through smartphones at this point, every piece of data or software you buy, they get a piece of. Whether you're downloading music or a computer program or anything, if you're doing something on your cell phone, Google or Apple get a piece of it. If you're buying something physical, chances are Amazon gets a piece of it. 
Amazon not only owns Amazon.com, but they do back-end fulfillment for millions of other websites. They host other websites. So even if you aren't buying from Amazon, you're probably giving Amazon money. So when it comes to data and information, it's those two are locked up by Google and Apple, which are worth a whole lot of money. Amazon basically owns physical things with maybe eBay and Etsy being on the side. But those marketplace companies are basically cash machines. So what they've done is looked around and said, what's left? What's left is services. So if they could create a marketplace where you get all of your services and they get a piece of it, it is a massive opportunity on the same scale as Google and Apple and Amazon. And so they want it bad. They want it really bad. And they don't have it figured out all the way yet. Um, you know, some people have been excited to see some companies like Homejoy go out of business, but that is version 1.0. And if you know anything about Silicon Valley, these guys just keep trying. They will spend a $300 million as a test and then try again and try again. For example, it's not been real well publicized, but Homejoy went out of business. What wasn't well publicized is Google went and hired every single programmer from Homejoy. They hired everyone. They just went in and said, you guys all work for Google now and brought them into Google. So if you Google cleaning service in San Francisco, you're going to see where the future is going. That six pack that I mentioned is gone. And what it's been replaced with is basically a find a cleaning contractor through Google sponsored link where Google wants to get a piece of every single transaction because that's where it's going is they want to figure out how they can enable the transactions through their platforms have the customers pay them and then take some money off of the top and pass it on. Um, and it's a trend that unfortunately I think is going to be difficult to fight. I think what is important is that you learn how to exist in it and how to compete in it as best you can and understand those changes as they're happening because it's not going to happen overnight. When you think about it, you know, we're only now seeing a lot of the major retailers having major problems and going out of business. Um, but Amazon has been shipping away from them since, you know, 1992. Well, I think if you're in this game for more than five or six years, you're going to have to figure out how to play with Google or Apple or somebody booking your clients in the future. Um, I don't love it. I don't like the idea of someone sitting between me and my customer, but I don't see an easy way to fight it. So I've got to figure out how to compete with it and how to win in that platform. Yeah. Well, there, there's so many implications to that. This is like, major, major, major stuff. If these guys pull the trigger on this, you're right. We're stuck. You know, we are at, they are the ultimate gatekeepers for sure. I mean, if anything, I can see why it's so important to have strong customer loyalty and to be top of mind with your customers. You know, the ones you already have, I mean, because you don't want them to be searching for you through Google every time they need to, you know, need a cleaning company. Are you looking for a simple way to get more sales, more referrals, and strengthen your customer loyalty? Look no further than sendjim.com. It was handcrafted for you as a powerful tool that will automate your follow-ups after the sale. Imagine being able to stay in contact with your customers all year long by pushing a single button on your smartphone. This is a space age warp speed technology and it will eliminate the chaos inside your business caused by trying to properly follow up with all of your leads and customers. Sign up for a free trial with no credit card required at sendjim.com right now. What are you waiting for? The Googles and those guys of the world are also 10,000% data driven. So when we talk about things like excellent customer service and great systems, you know, Google doesn't want to run a cleaning service. That's kind of where Homejoy went wrong. They tried to be a cleaning service and discovered it. It's a really tough business. And they decided they didn't want to talk to customers. So Google and those guys have kind of caught on that they don't want to own the company. Um, what they want is to hire great companies that provide great service that can be tracked and monitored through their platform. So all those systems and processes are going to become even more important. Um, the other thing, though, just to kind of explain where this is all going, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but Google paid a little over a billion dollars a couple of years ago to buy a company called Nest. And Nest makes home automation systems. And their initial systems that they made were smoke detectors and thermostats, and more recently they've introduced webcams. But Nest has made it very clear that their goal is to automate your entire home, including access, uh, basically keys to your home. 
And there was an example of this on Shark Tank a while ago. I don't know if you remember. Shark Tank had an episode where if you showed up with a cell phone, you didn't need keys, it could read your cell phone and let you into the house. Yeah, well, Google invested in Nest because they want to basically control basically everything that happens in your house. So the future of where this is going is you're going to search Google, select a cleaning service on Google. Google is then going to dispatch to somebody like my company who's going to show up with an Android Google-owned smartphone. That smartphone is going to know that I'm the cleaning company that was hired at this date and time at your house. It's going to unlock the lock, which is owned by Google, to let me in your house. It's going to log how long I'm in your house, probably watch me on the cameras, which are owned by Google in your house, log the time I leave your house, charge you exactly to the second for the amount of time I'm in your house. And it knows that because it's able to track that off the locks and the mobile phones, which are used for access. This is where it's all going to. And that's sort of the 10 to 20 year vision of how Google and Apple and these guys are going to dominate the home services is they're basically going to be giving away or highly subsidizing the devices that automate the house. And then once they have control of the house, they're going to then have control of access to the house and the service providers. Oh, I don't know if it's just me. Actually, I'm sure it's not just me, but that is absolutely terrifying (laughs) in so many ways. But at the same time, you're right. These guys are not slowing down. They're not going away. This isn't going to stop. It doesn't matter if it terrifies you. This is happening, people. And we need to prepare and position our companies to to capitalize on this stuff. I mean, it, it's a little uncomfortable to think about the way that technology is so intrusive now. But, you know, at the same time, I, I, I know you agree. We have to prepare. I think you have to prepare, and I think what it's going to do is actually drive a fair amount of consolidation in our industry. Because once again, I don't think Google, they, they learned through the experience with HomeJoy. I don't know if you know this, but Google was one of HomeJoy's major backers, that they didn't like managing cleaners. Um, so I, I think where this is all going to go is there's going to be a few large companies in each area in the long run that are going to be dominant on these platforms. And I know you mentioned there's a bunch of smaller companies listening, and that can sound scary, but understand that nobody is in on any of this yet. So one of the ways you could get to be one of those big companies in the future is to find out how to play with Google, how to win with Google, how to make it as they do these things, that you eventually become massive with them and you grow as they grow. Because it's where it's going to. And unless something happens with legislative changes or antitrust laws, <clears throat> I, I don't see how to fight it. So, and I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to scream at the wind. If that's the way the wind's blowing, I'm going to figure out how to grow with it. And so that's my job is to figure out how to position my company to win with those changes. Yeah. And you mentioned consolidation. Much of the cleaning space has low barrier to entry, right? So there's, it's a highly fragmented space. I mean, whether it's window cleaning, pressure cleaning, home cleaning, maid services, lawn care, um, lawn care is not cleaning, but it's a home service business. All these, there's, there's so many companies in these spaces, but if this stuff comes to fruition, I could see that getting much, much, much tighter because you're going to essentially just become irrelevant. If you don't have the right systems, the right reputation and the right processes in place, you're, you're not going to get noticed at all, thereby not included in any of their search results or any of the connections or any of these services. And it's going to be really tough to, to even have a service business maybe in, in the coming years. Oh, yeah. In some ways, it'll be easier than ever because Google's going to have all the tools and you can just get the stuff right off the shelf and use it from them. You won't have to build a lot of this like we have in the past. But on the flip side, it's going to be a brutal meritocracy. It's going to be very clear who the good companies are and who the bad companies are and what type of... Uh, customer satisfaction they have. So it's both going to be an opportunity, but it's also going to be a pretty big risk. Well, it's going to be an opportunity for people like you, Derek, and people out there in America that are ready to focus on providing high-level service to growing you know, profitable companies, to helping their employees reach their personal goals, like you said. And people like that have nothing to be afraid of with this, but who should be afraid is the mediocre owner-operator or small service company that's just kind of flying under the radar. This this stuff is actually going to be very good for the consumer, like you said. It's going to make things super easy for them, and it's going to give them a high uh, level of trust, You know, knowing all the online reputations. Everything will be aggregated together. They're going to know exactly who they're hiring. Super fascinating stuff. I, <laughs> I don't know if you have any final thoughts or not, but uh, I just need to digest kind of what you've laid out there already. 
it's sometimes tricky, but my encouragement always to people is, number one, always do the Google Plus page first, that Google local listing. Number two is find somewhere that you can dominate. You know, in the residential cleaning space, which is the one that I know the best, we've got reoccurring customers. So I, it takes me about 400 customers to hit a million in revenue. So I don't need to hit everybody in the world. If Yelp, if everyone in your area is using Yelp and Angie's List isn't as popular and you can become number one on Angie's List, do Angie's List first. Find one that you can own. And then once you own it, move to the next, move to the next. Look for the new platform. Look for the new thing. Try to go where others aren't. You don't always want to go head to head with people. And the nice thing is there are so many opportunities now because of all the changes that are coming. You can almost decide which one. You know, I spent all this time talking about Google today, but 25% of consumers still use Bing or uh, Yahoo. So everyone's out there trying to figure out how to be number one on Google. There could be a real case to be made to be number one on Yahoo because you don't need to have the world. You just need a small segment of it to have a million dollar company. Wow. That's really good advice. And, uh, it's spoken like a true entrepreneur because there is truly opportunity everywhere. If we just open our eyes, I always like to say God gave all the birds plenty of food, but he didn't put it in their nest. We got to go out there and get it. I think we have a lot of gold nuggets in here. There's a lot to unpack. Uh, I just want to thank you for joining me, taking <laughs> you know time out of your Monday. I don't know when people are listening to this, but this is going to help people for several years as it's out there on the interwebs. Uh, how can people get in contact with you if they need to? Sure. Um, we didn't mention at the beginning because I uh, didn't want to make the bio take too long, but I also am a co-owner and publisher of an online trade publication for cleaning business owners. It's called cleaningbusinesstoday.com. It is only online, but we do a weekly newsletter. And we set it up because uh, we got kind of sick of the trade publications in our industry because they were all about, A, how to clean things and not about how to run the business. And B, they often were things like how to pick a vacuum by a company that makes vacuum cleaners. And obviously, that's a slightly biased article. So we uh, set up our, that uh, website out there. You can contact us through that website. Um, I write at least twice a month on there. And a lot of the things I talked about, like the trend with home joy and some of the stuff that's going on, are all covered out there. As well as we didn't even get into it today, we've got a big article about uh, how risky 1099 employees are right now and why you may not want to do that with some of the guidance that the government's come out with. And it's topics like that that we cover. Well, that's perfect. I just appreciate that. Everybody go to cleaningbusinesstoday.com. Sign up for the free newsletter so you can learn about this type of information every week from someone who's doing it every week in their real business, running his multi seven figure business. Derek, thank you so much. Have an awesome day. All right, thank you, you too. Hey, thanks for hanging out, friends. And from all of us here at the Quick Talk Podcast team, we hope you love today's show. We hope that you were inspired to become a doer and not just a listener. Apply what you've heard today in your own business and watch things change for the better. Lastly, remember that all the money in the world can't save your soul. Seek first the kingdom of God, my friends. We'll see you next time. For more information about the Quick Talk Podcast or Joshua's other businesses, visit our website, quicktalkpodcast.com. Have a blessed day.